Yes. They are. Uh, I'm actually introducing the moderator today. Uh, Lonnie Hunt, I've known him for a long time. He has a long history of public service. I met him first when he was a county judge for Houston County. Uh, that's where he still claims his home. Uh, he later went to work for the Texas Association of Counties and uh, was proud to say that he covered all 254 counties. He now uh, heads up the uh, director for the Deep East Texas Council of Governments, where I know he puts his heart and soul in each of those counties and working with adjacent uh, COGS and stuff like that. So, Lonnie Hunt. Thank you, Senator. Now I get to introduce you. Uh, brief <laughs> introductions of the panel. Uh, you all know Senator Robert Nichols. He's my senator. I'm proud to say that. We're very proud of him over in East Texas. And, and Lord knows, I don't know, how, 30 how many ever counties he represents. Uh, of course, from Jacksonville, Texas, was Mayor of Jacksonville. We like the fact that he was a, a local elected official in his community. Uh, transportation, uh, what's the title? Uh, transportation um, czar, is that the word? Oh, I, I don't use that one. Uh, currently uh, chairman of the Senate Transportation Committee and also a member of the Finance Committee and Natural Resources and several other important Senate committees. We appreciate Senator Nichols being here with us. Thank you. Next to him is Representative Ernest Bales. Uh, he's one of our deep East Texas legislators as well, House District 18, which is currently San Jacinto, where he lives, along with Liberty and Walker. and. I think he's going to pick up the good folks in Hardin County after the redistricting. So uh, he's also a member of the Agriculture and Livestock Committee and Corrections Committee from uh, Shepherd, Texas, down in San Jacinto County, Representative Bales. And then we have Representative John Kimple, House District 44 over in Guadalupe and Wilson Counties. And uh, he is a Vice Chair of the Licensing and Administrative Procedures Committee, also on the Environmental Regulation Committee. Big UT Longhorn, former football player for the Horns. They're coming back. Let's hope so. Let's hope so. Okay. That was our first Let's question for the us. panel. <laughs> and then you we have Representative video. Dennis Paul, uh, native of Houston, represents southeastern Harris County, including the, uh, I guess, what I would call the NASA area down there. Uh, he is a civil engineer by trade and also a member of the Natural Resources Committee and the Insurance Committee and the founding member or founder of the Aerospace Caucus, I understand. So we appreciate Representative Dennis Paul. We've got a lot to talk about with infrastructure and so I'm gonna jump right in here and kind of the toss up really for everybody uh, is, and we'll start with you, Senator Nichols, and then go down the list and see what others have to say. We've seen an amazing amount of growth in Texas, uh, about 10 million new residents in the last 20 years, uh, which is basically a 50% increase in our population. Is our infrastructure keeping up with this growth, and do you have specific concerns about the capacity of infrastructure in Texas uh, that, that we're going to need moving forward? Thank you. Uh, the answer to your question, no, we have not been able to keep up. Uh, we have made progress, but there's a progress. Uh, more money, more infrastructure goes down, but the growth is so great. And what complicates the factor is it's not spread out uniformly across the state. Uh, that growth is concentrated in four major urban areas where somewhere uh, between 90 and 95 percent of all the new growth is in those areas. And road conditions, although the pavement is good, as you increase the number of people on a road, you don't just straight line get more congestion. It becomes exponential. So, you, you know, that's why it's so difficult uh, in those urban areas to get around. So congestion is a real thing. Uh, Dow, the Metroplex was able to actually lower their um, congestion rate about 10 percent over a decade. But now, with the shortage of their funding, uh, it's going to start ramping the other way. And we're seeing that increase in uh, congestion growing in all of our urbans. Uh, for the rural areas of the state, uh, it's a connectivity issue, maintenance, and safety. Um, so most of the people dying, although 87 percent of the traffic movement is on those big urban areas, 60 percent or plus, that number may be changing a little bit, are dying on the 
two-lane rural roads of Texas. That's where the real danger spots are. Representative Bales, your thoughts on that? And, and by the way, you're best of both worlds here, definitely in a rural county, but you're about 50 miles north of downtown Houston at the same time. I am. I've got one of the last few rural districts that we have, and uh, we also have three of the fastest growing school districts in the state of Texas. So we have areas that were predominantly all low-lying timberland, um, slow drainage, and now those are developed. One of those particular areas, an area of eight years, has an additional 35,000 residents, and that is supported by one two-lane farm-to-market highway. It's now going to be tech connecting to the 99 Parkway that same development's gonna have two exits on that 99 Parkway. It, it neighbors Harris County, but those areas, we can't grow fast enough. So that's something that we're, we're always gonna be up against and just how do we fund that and how do we achieve that growth without the labor force and without the funding. So that's something that we're gonna to have to steadily uh, contend with. I think the state demographer has expect us, the population of the state of Texas to double by 2050. So we already don't like the congestion and the current construction projects, and uh, we can only expect those to amplify even more. Representative Kimpel, you're in that very high growth corridor between Austin and San Antonio. Uh, how are things going over there? Well, we could always use more. Uh, you know, you said, Ernest had mentioned that how fast they're growing. When you, th you think of Guadalupe County, the kind of triangle of the three cities between New Braunfels, San Marcos, and Seguin, you know, between San Antonio and Austin. And I tell you, just the hometown boy from Seguin, they're building 12,000 houses in Seguin in the next four years that are platted and are going to break ground. They hadn't built 12,000 houses in Seguin ever. Um, <laughs> seriously, you have a half, but I'm trying to think about it. You know, I live in a house that was built 1940, so it just goes to tell you. Anyway. With those houses come people, and um, we're, I guess we're fortunate in the sense that we're, we're close enough to San Antonio and Austin that we have access to two interstates, 35 and 10, that are, are being rebuilt right now, so that, but, you know, the challenge is that the eastern part and the kind of the northern, when you get into Wilson County, and now that I'll, I'll pick up Gonzales County too, which is completely rural, but, um, you know, the, the western part of my district, northern part of Wilson County, you know, all kind of suburbs of Bear County. But then you get into the eastern parts and the southern part of my district, and it is rural, completely rural. And so we have the unique challenge of, you know, the mobility of high population urban areas, but also the challenge of, I mean, the farm to market, everybody thinks of farm to market. In my district and the eastern part of my district, they are literally farm to market. When, you know, I give continued complaints of, uh, and the senator mentioned this, you know, the connectivity and, and the, I think most importantly, the the maintenance and the safety. And I, I continually hear that, you know, when my constituents are dragging cattle trailers to the Seguin Cattle Company for the sale on Wednesday afternoon, you know, they're worried about the shoulders on FM 464 and blowing out tires and running cars off the road because of the shoulders of our road. And so the, some of the challenges we have on a smaller scale, uh, you know, it seems that, you know, a lot of mobility, uh, again, as Senator Nichols said, you know, the, the four larger urban areas where 90% of the people are, it seems where a lot of the money goes, moving folks around. But, you know, and uh, maybe with the exception of Dennis, but the three of us over here have have those rural areas that we, we need to maintain focus on and, and help as much as we can when it just comes to making it safe for those folks. Representative Paul, I'm curious for your take, not only as a legislator, but as a civil engineer. And, and also, you know, we're talking about the need for new infrastructure for all this growth, but what about our existing infrastructure and is it aging? Or are we, are we doing a good job keeping up what we've already put into place? Well, uh, thank you, Judge, and, and it's uh, good to be here in Nacogdoches, and uh, thanks for the invite to be on the panel uh, with y'all. It's a beautiful part of the state. Um, yeah, I think, uh, again, we, we haven't been keeping up with that growth. I think the growth has, has been tremendous. But the legislature over the last several years has done a lot to work and answer those conditions in all parts of infrastructure. Uh, I was first elected in 2014, but in uh, 2012, a lot of the members that are, that are here were part of that, uh, voted on to uh, create a new water 
pit where we were able to put $2 billion into a water that the citizens of Texas also voted on as a constitutional amendment. Put $2 billion in to put more, more water so we can get more fresh water. And obviously without water, you're not going to be able to survive. And water is something we fight a, a lot over in the legislature. The <laughs> West, you know, don't have it. The East does, and they want to protect it. But uh, so we've done that. We put money in Prop 1, Prop 7, and transportation over the last two times, uh, or over the last several years, to put an additional you know, 4 or $5 billion a year into TxDOT to start taking care of these uh, deals. Uh, wastewater, you know, the Water Development Board has done a lot to, to take care of wastewater and how we work on it. But I think also we need to really be looking at power, too, to make sure that our, our power has got enough generation to make sure that we don't go through something like we did with URI. Most of us, you know, I have a generator at the house. Most people probably have something now, too, to, uh, to take care of those peaks. But we want to make sure that there's enough power uh, also there, too. So I think all those are infrastructure needs uh, that the legislature is going to have to address and, and go through it. Uh, you know, my district is is beyond what, what Ernest was just talking about his is just the starting tip of that growing to be a part of this suburb of Houston where mine's been a 20 years 30 years ago Larry was uh, was part of growing up out in our area it was you were that far out suburban but now we're we're inner city suburban and it's gone through that that growth there so uh, it's just a, a tremendous thing that we're gonna have to keep up with and, and uh, I'll tell you what the 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 members of the legislature that I've been working with have all decided to hit, answer that head on and, and provided these answers just like I've given you today of, of where we've been trying to work those needs. I think I saw Senator Nichols anxious to say something else there. Well, yeah, I was want to make sure everybody had plenty of time to say what they wanted. But the one factor that most people forget when it comes to transportation, first, there's, there's more than just roads for transportation. There's rail, airports, waterways, all very vital to the state. But in funding transportation, we often forget, I don't forget, but most people kind of forget, roads and bridges do not last forever. Typical lifespans, 40 or 50 years, if you're out in West Texas where it's dry and there's not much traffic, they're going to last longer. But if you're in the Houston area where we don't really even have rocks in the ground, we have to bring rocks in um, where it rains a lot and there's heavy traffic, those roads are going to tear up a whole lot quicker. And the cost to maintain, so every 40 years or so, we have to rebuild the entire highway system. Rebuild the whole thing. When you think about the interstate was completed in 1972, that was over 50 years ago. We have to go and rebuild the entire interstate system. The 40-something thousand miles of foreign market system, it's over 50 years old. We gotta rebuild the whole thing while we add new capacity and those urban centers, which are the most expensive and most complicated projects in the entire state. Someone brought up Prop 1 and Prop 7, which has put a lot more money into the state highway fund, but what's the concern about the move toward uh, electric vehicles? Or, or is our gasoline tax going to eventually dry up and go away, and isn't that a significant portion of our current highway funding and and what are we going to do about that who wants to jump in there on that question up go right ahead senator the um i look forward to electric vehicles especially when i found out you can go zero to 60 in three seconds <laughs> and i uh, saw an all electric uh, pickup truck that will spin on a dime just like a lawnmower uh very powerful trucks um and it's a paradigm shift. We are going to go through a paradigm shift. General Motors says 50% of everything they sell is gonna be electric in just about six years. And you're right, they do not pay um, a vehicle sales tax. And so we as a state, as good public policy, need to make an adjustment in their electric vehicles. And probably the best way to do that is to adjust the vehicle registration fee, it's already constitutionally dedicated to the state highway fund. And uh, we have done studies to know, and we know it's about $200 a year that that adjustment needs to be made. I think we've got 32 other states have already done it. I will also say the Senate has passed that bill twice, two different sessions, and sent it to the House <laughs> members. Uh, I will be carrying the bill myself, and we will swiftly send it over there. And uh, 
let y'all improve it as y'all do. <laughs> or do the House members want to either rebut that or or just uh, offer any other thoughts about? Well, uh, I, the I will say yeah, the House Senator. always makes an improvement. <laughs> yes, and knock real loud when you bring it over. <laughs> Uh, you know, this morning, uh, those that were in the breakfast session where Speaker Phelan uh, spoke, uh, I don't think I was the only one that heard this, but he, he, he I'm paraphrasing him, he was talking about our Comptroller going to New York and uh, bragging about $12.9 million in the rainy day fund and the, the bankers in New York are saying, you know, $7 billion would be a pretty healthy balance there and you guys really need to do something about your infrastructure. Is Will there be any appetite for taking some additional money out of that rainy day fund, or, or if not taking it out, not putting more in and diverting that to more of these infrastructure needs? Yeah, I have the appetite. I think there has to be. Yeah, I think that's a good use for that. And what we've used some of that excess over the last couple of years, like I, you know, I mentioned the, the, the water bill that, that they did before I was there, but uh, we took that money out of the rainy day fund. So I think there's ways that we can take some of that excess money because, like you said, there's a there's constitutional cap of where it could be and try to use that for infrastructure. Uh, I think for sure uh, we're going to be looking at ways to use this for some property tax relief, you know, that, that the citizens of, of Texas are desperate for. So I think we're going to have some property tax relief out of that funds. But, again, putting some of it in infrastructure uh, or coastal barrier or something like that that we'll need uh, that money for. Since you brought up the coastal barrier, I want to stick with you. I know that's a project that uh, you're passionate about. It's near and dear to your heart. Why, why do we need that coastal barrier to protect Galveston Bay? And, and do we know what it's going to cost and how we're going to get it done? Yeah, sure. It, uh, it is vital to the whole state of Texas that we get this done. And uh, Senator Taylor and I carried a legislation uh, last time to create a Gulf Coast Protection District that could uh, oversee and manage this uh, uh, the, the construction of it. Uh, the Corps of Engineers have come up with a whole Texas coast uh, project, which is about $26 billion. Uh, we, we think that it's probably going to be about $20 billion to take care of the part of Galveston Bay. And we could even maybe just for $15 billion build the, the main uh, barrier across Galveston Bay itself. But that's probably about 35 to 40 percent of the state's gross domestic product comes out of that. And in fact, even it's 5 to 10 percent of the whole gross product of the United States as a whole is all done right there. The, the refining of the fuels are critical to all of us. The port coming in and out of there is, is tremendous, and it's the number one port in the United States. So this is just a tremendous uh, economic impact for this whole state and whole region. Certainly East Texas is, is probably having a huge benefit of it. We're, obviously very tied to the city of Houston and what goes on in Galveston Bay and our ports. So it's uh, critical that we get it done and I'm glad to be able to answer questions on that and make sure that everybody up here understands too the critical need that we get it. It will be the largest engineering project in the history of the United States. Just put things in perspective of, of what this would be. And Congress is, uh, the, like I said, the Corps got their plan. They're all ready to go. They were asking Congress to fund it. And Congress funds this type of legislation in the even number of years, so hopefully uh, that we'll get it. I know that our area representatives and our senators are supportive of, and are working to get that funding out of Washington, uh, but we'll, we'll see. So keep asking your guys to help out. Are there other particular uh, issues related to ports and waterways that, uh, that any of you, uh, uh, Senator Nichols, you now, you've got... Port of Beaumont, I guess. Uh, you've got ports in your district. Yeah, I've got several ports, uh, but the, you also have the waterway, and the waterway is extremely critical uh, with all the oil, and now we have natural gas. I know all of y'all have been watching TV uh, about the Ukraine and now how dependent Europe is on natural gas from Russia. Uh, that natural gas comes from our gas fields and is compressed and, and liquefied on the Gulf Coast now, and it goes out several of our waterways. I know it goes out to Sabine Natchez, and I know they do it down in Corpus. And it's going to be extremely important to the state, to the nation, and to other countries to help stabilize uh, some of the evil forces that are out there. And now, uh, I thought it was very forward thinking when those were built. We have to build the infrastructure not only here on our coast, but we also have to build the infrastructure in foreign ports. 
uh, so that you can unload it. But uh, critically important, and uh, they're moving as fast as they can to build several more. Uh, those waterways, that's just the gas part of it. Uh, those auto, they also ship out a lot of oil and stuff like that. But uh, the ships are getting bigger. Uh, they widened the Panama Canal, made it deeper, longer, the locks to get you up and down. Uh, and the ships, they call them the, uh, the ships that they used from Asia to the west coast, can now travel through the Panama Canal and come to our east coast. But our major waterways are not ready today. We cannot take those big ships because we have to take our ship channels wider and deeper. It sounds like just a matter of going out there and dredging it, but all we have thousands of pipelines underneath those ship channels that have to be lowered. So they got to go down there and cut them and weld them and move them. But all those projects are happening and moving forward, uh, not as fast as I would like and not as fast as they would like. Uh, but that's the plan. We got to get those things deeper and wider. Yeah, and I'll just throw in too, you know, the, I, I got a lot of the Port of Houston in my district and uh, the Port of Houston was funding its dredging on itself to get these large containers as the senator, uh, container ships as the senator just mentioned, but we're starting to get some of that federal funding, but we've been doing it on our own. But all the other ports, I mean, like you mentioned, in Beaumont, Corpus, Brownsville, Texas City, Galveston, I mean, they're in desperate need of, of infrastructure, not only just the water infrastructure, but also highway uh, infrastructure and roadway to get trucks in and out of there so they're not messing with the, the civilians, you know, trying to get where they could get in and out of there easy or maybe a separated uh, way of doing it. Uh, get the trucks in and out is another critical part of infrastructure to do it. And I know we had created a, a special port uh, fund, but we've never funded it as a legislature. Going back to the rainy day fund question, you know, that would be something we could maybe do. Uh, but there's a lot of infrastructure need on these ports all across the state. I think one of the biggest parts that we have to do is the, the public education aspect of it. Myself, rural southeast Texas, I'm not next to the ports, but it's still a huge part of what our economy, our economy is. We're the, we're the leader in both import and exports on raw agricultural products, our LNG and our larger TEU vessels and everything. And we, it, as he mentioned trucks coming through. Typical people have a negative connotation of large commercial vehicles. So, I mean, my family, that's what I was born and raised in. So we ran commercial trucks for a living. Everyone is quick to go to Walmart or go to Amazon. You're glad to get that package there at your doorstep, but you completely rule out the aspect that every product that you have probably came here on a con in a Connex container and was delivered on the back of a semi from the port to its distribution point. So however we can help people understand the, the necessary aspect of you don't have to go very far and you see all the large billboards hit by an 18 wheeler call us. So uh, we say we are pro business, but we're not very pro business when we try to discourage commerce at every turn. I want to just throw out uh, uh, agriculture. Uh, Senator, uh, Representative Bells, I know you're a, you're a rancher and you're in, you're, you have an agriculture of related business. Uh, any particular concerns or needs in the agriculture community, and we'll start with you, but anybody else please jump in here, uh, that, you know, that would benefit agriculture in Texas, the relationship with our infrastructure? I think as Senator Nichols and a lot of the other members have mentioned, connectivity is the biggest part. Um, our rural areas, the county where I live, San Jacinto County, it's 80% forested. Liberty County is very similar. Hardin County is no different. They've got one development there in Hardin County. I've met with a developer. That one development, the structures built within that one development, where they have a higher EV estimated value of all other current structures in the whole county. And it's pre pre predominantly serviced by rural farm to market roads. So as you get a huge influx of additional passenger vehicles on those with commercial trucks, it's not a healthy balance. And like they mentioned, um, John mentioned the shoulders, it's you, you try to be mindful of what's happening there, but then again, we're gonna get the growth, but those, only, those houses are only built by the dimensional lumber that comes out of those same forests there. So it's a uh, connectivity's huge, ports are just a huge aspect of it. I mean, 
even to sim oversimplify that a little bit, rural broadband, that comes up a lot. You have DFW Metroplex. I've met with the developers there, and they say, well, we have these towers we can put up. They're 100 foot tall. You have something called the FAA. You have to stay below a certain height before it's an issue with FAA. But we have a lot of pine trees that are far taller than uh, 100 foot tall, and those uh, it doesn't just penetrate that canopy. So that's a big part of, of what we deal with. And I mean, when you have to pull over at a McDonald's to uh, use their Wi-Fi to buy bulls online in Kansas, it's, uh, it's something we deal with there. But um, I, I just think that's a huge part that, that we often overlook. Everyone wants to move from our urban centers and come to our rural areas because you want a rural way of life, but they still expect the same level of service and it doesn't happen that way. So that's one thing we're always going to be up against. We're definitely going to come back to broadband in a moment to maybe kind of close out. But Representative Kemple, you, you, you represent a region or a district that's fast growing. Part of your district's fast becoming more urban. And yet you mentioned you're about to take on Gonzales County, which is very rural. Uh, with so much demand caused by the population growth in our urban and suburban areas, how can rural Texas make sure we get our fair share of future investments in all these infrastructure projects? Stay active with your electeds. You know, we always, <clears throat> you think about it, you have the four or five big population centers in the state of Texas and the Texas House are represented probably by a Oh, half to maybe 100 out of 150 of the representatives, which means you still have, you know, 50 to 60 rural representatives. And we do have different groups and caucuses up there that, that make sure that we we carry those interests with us and, and make sure that they're taken care of. You know, I'm a prime example. You know, having the, the urban areas, but also having the completely rural areas that, you know, didn't have the interstate doesn't have anything doesn't maybe doesn't even have rail and and so the financially viable and, and depend on foreign to markets and, and smaller uh you know even county roads fm roads for our commerce you know then in guadalupe county and everything we've mentioned up here is is important to us you know the ports we're per capita probably the largest manufacturing county in the state with commercial metals and Caterpillar, Continental, you know, we employ probably close to 10,000 people. Uh, and everything comes through the port or on rail or on some of those smaller highways. So we, we face all the challenges in, in the fast growing area. And, you know, challenges are good. We, you know, if we didn't have challenges, we <laughs> would mean we're dead. You know, so challenges are good. You know, there's other states that would love to be in our position right mm -hmm. now. But at the same time, uh, it's up to us that, you know, we always, Senator Nichols said it right off the bat, no, we don't have enough, and we always have to be creative with the ways that, you know, going forward. And it is, you know, I wanted to go back to, you know, we're kidding about the registration fees on vehicles, but he hit the nail on the head. That's really the only way to... To do it going forward if we have i mean you mentioned gm but ford um even the domestic auto manufacturers have all said you know in the next 10 years i mean staggering number of cars that they're going to manufacture are going to you know they're in the 70 80 percent range of all being electric so we have to do something to get ahead of it for sure and if we don't do something like that um we're dead Yes, sir. You, you used a term, and you kind of skipped past it real quick. You said fair share. We spent a lot of time at the legislature trying to determine what is fair. Everybody agrees they want to do it fair, but we have widely different opinions of what is fair. Uh, if you think in terms of, well, you know, the rural put this much money in the, the rural part of Texas puts this amount of money into the coffers of the state highway fund we have 80 percent of the geography of the state is in the rural areas yet it's the urban areas i don't represent the urban areas but the urban areas contribute about 87 percent of all the money that goes in the state highway fund that's probably changed a little bit with prop one uh, but it's really the urban areas that are subsidizing the rural system so when we're talking to the urban members about fair, 
uh, they would, I'm not speaking for them, but they would say that's not fair, especially since they're drowning in congestion. So it's a real balancing act, making sure that we're building the connectivity in the rural areas. We're building, maintaining, preserving, adding safety projects, which has been a very high priority of the uh, commission um, over the last uh, number of years. Yeah, now, that's a, that, no, that's right. And one thing I, I kind of omitted was um, the Eagleford Shell that y'all know kind of runs from Laredo up to Victoria. And we're not, Guadalupe and Wilson County are not producers in that. But I tell you what, between the Hill Country and South Texas, there are plenty of roads that those gravel haulers and the caliche haulers mm -hmm. use. So when we pass Prop 1, the few of us kind of in that, that part of the world that, you know, aren't getting the local taxes out of the, out of the production, but certainly feeling the, the pressure and the, and the wear and tear on our roads, we're, you know, able to get some of those northern counties uh, included in Prop 1 to get some of that relief money to come back. And because, I mean, you'll see belly dumps. And I, you know, it, when they start producing and start drilling more wells down there, my office starts getting more phone calls. And it's just something we have to do, whether it's safety, whether it's rebuilding roads, maintaining roads. And we got to the point in South Texas where they're just grinding roads up. Yeah. I, I want to echo one point. It's uh, we don't have enough rural votes to pass anything in the Texas legislature. You look at how the impact of redistricting, even like Senator Nichols, he's, uh, he's our rural guy, but essentially we will not have any more rural senators in the state of Texas. So Senator Nichols now represents far greater population than U.S. Congressman does. So you have to look at that. One thing that we're very fortunate in the state of Texas is we, we're not extremely divisive R versus D. I have more in common with a Democratic colleague in South Texas or in the West Texas border than I have fundamentally with some of my neighbors just right there in, in Houston, which is the south of me, because we understand infrastructure, struggles of public schools. See, I have three and a quarter counties that I represent. So every one of my counties has less than a third of a vote. And how many does Harris County have alone? So relationships are everything. I mean, we may not have the oil and gas production, so we don't, we don't receive the benefit from a financial and tax <coughs> aspect of that. But all of those pipelines that come from the Permian actually go right through all the counties that I represent. So it, it is big picture, and that's one thing that we have to do a really good job of as rural members and help our urban colleagues understand the overall impact and how the big picture fits together that affords both sides to flourish. We're just about out of time, and I, I've got to throw a toss up out there about our digital infrastructure. Uh, and so I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and just we'll, we'll maybe start on the end with Representative Paul and come this way and end with Senator Nichols. Uh, obviously, uh, broadband was a major topic in the 87th legislature. House Bill 5 passed, Senator Nichols uh, ushering that through the Senate, Representative Ashby, and with lots of help, ushering it through the House. Uh, did we get it right in House Bill 5? And are you pleased with the progress that is already being made by the new Texas Broadband Development Office? And a threefer here, what do we need to do in the 88th legislature to build on that and keep the momentum going? Well, um, I think uh, I was very proud of the work that we've done already, and it's something that we've been working on over the last couple of sessions to finally get it done. And, you know, the, even the governor made it a priority in the last session that when we got answered that with House Bill 5, uh, Doc Anderson was on an earlier panel, and I've been working with Doc, and he's been working on this broadband stuff for the last couple of sessions. Uh, he had a bill with a middle mile trying to make sure that you could use other existing infrastructure of, of of cable lines or, or phone lines where you could have a uh, high-speed internet be able to piggyback off of those. So I think it's something critical we have. Uh, also in the earlier panels, they talked about how much they're using it for medical and also for educational purposes. So I think this is uh, another, with water and power, another way of uh, infrastructure that's going to have to be done and kept up in place. You know, even in the city of Houston, uh, where I'm at, there's dead zones and, and uh, they call it broadband um, 
Um, I'm escaping the right word. Deserts. De yeah, deserts. Yeah, broadband deserts, even though you're in the city of Houston. And we've been working a lot. We had a bill uh, two sessions ago where we could put uh, uh, high-speed internet and, and five, uh, 5G stuff on, on city uh, city equipment like uh, light poles and things where the cities were saying, all right, if you want to stick it on my light pole, it's going to cost you $300,000. You know, so we, we were able to, to do that so we could do it and take care of some of these deserts even in a more urban area like mine. So I, I think it's, it's something that we're done on the right progress. I think we're making good progress on it and very proud of what we've done so far. Yeah, I agree with Dennis uh, wholeheartedly. Yeah, I, I supported the bill a couple of sessions ago that expanded broadband in some of the rural areas through our, our electric co-ops. Um, we did a lot last time, and I know I just saw a survey that uh, a friend of mine had sent that was representing some of the larger companies that are offering broadband to uh, use surveys with county judges, county commissioners, and see like that and what we could do going forward. So it'll be, a, it'll be an issue for certainly going, uh, I mean, in the 88th, 89th, it'll continue to grow as, as that technology grows. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a huge part. And I think the silver lining to COVID was a greater realization for the need, both for online learning, for telemedicine, telehealth, and all aspects of that. I mean, that was probably the, the most positive thing that came out of the, that tragic pandemic on helping people understand um, that they can, they can work from home, but they have to have that connectivity. So with that being said, we had opportunity to be at one of the meetings in Beaumont, the comptroller's office through, through the office. I think it's done really good work on bringing everybody together, try to listen and find out how best to serve the areas. But it's also, um, I think it's very important. We also have small local providers and we need to make sure that they are not left out of that equation. We have a lot of institutional knowledge and capabilities with our large national companies and we never, we never need to lose sight of that, but also we have existing infrastructure that if they are providing that service in an area, we need to make sure that they are not overbuilt, that we put a greater emphasis in areas that currently have no available service. And that's one of the things that I think we always have to be very cognizant of. In our rural areas, we don't do a good job as far as the mapping. So trying to work with the comptroller's office to make sure that we have good quality mapping for the rural areas so that they're not engulfed, overbuilt, when we have areas that have zero access. Senator Nichols, you get the final word. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, you, you spent a lot of time working on this issue yourself. You've done an outstanding job at the Deep East Texas Council of Governments, understanding it, educating the counties, and working on down. So kudos to you, and thanks for your work on that. Uh, we knew, we in the rural area knew uh, Wi-Fi, I just call it high-speed internet, was an issue and we didn't have it and we desperately needed it. It did not really become a statewide issue until the pandemic hit and the schools had to go virtual. All of a sudden, it became a statewide problem and it, everybody's attention focused on that one thing. How are we going to educate those kids without uh, high-speed broadband? And it was an urban issue, like he was talking about, uh, uh, broadband deserts. You may have it there close to you, but if you can't afford to access it, how are you going to, edu how are you going to use, use it to educate the children? And so beginning a couple of years ago in the session, um, we started seeing huge statewide support, all parties, bipartisan. It's great. I don't, uh, 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 Temple Industries, uh, who spends a lot of resources in what I call the forest country of that 43 county area. Um, where they had a lot of investments, they spent a lot of resources uh, uh, hiring technical people that helped Trent and I put the initial drafting language together. And then uh, I know on the Senate side, he carried it in the House, I carried it in the Senate. Uh, Lieutenant Governor was very interested in it. He knew how important it was to the rural areas. And so there was a lot of really good work that went into that. I mean, I cannot take credit for some of the craftsmanship that was in there. Uh, but there are a lot of smart people worked on that thing. And that's something that has thrilled me to see everybody come together. The mapping that the Federal Communication did a decade ago, they did a mapping by census block. So, for instance, 
San Augustine County is a census block. And if anybody had asked high speed internet in that census block, they considered that county served. And they showed it as it has high speed internet. That was the first problem. Second problem was they had a different definition for high speed internet for the rural areas. It was 10 megabytes download. But if you're in urban, they defined high speed as 25 and down. So we weren't even treated equally there. Uh, at the federal level, and in the way it's being mapped now, every single, every single residence address and business address will be um, counted, and it will be shown as it has high-speed internet, and we defined it much higher, uh, or it's available within one billing cycle. In other words, you can call your provider and have it hook it up. Uh, you either served or you're not and have it available. And so that's going to be significant. And that broadband office is out doing that mapping right now. They're working with the feds and they're working with uh, Connect Texas and Connect USA uh, has done a great job so far. But if we're going to get every single address. And then we're going to identify those areas that are poorly served, that do not have the infrastructure, and that grant money, the legislature put in a half a billion uh, uh, funds to help leverage that and then everybody will have a chance to participate on that rulemaking uh, once they actually put those out there and I wish we'd done it two years earlier because now the federal government recognizes the same issue and we've we're gonna as a state pick up probably another cut two billion dollars just for high-speed internet and, uh, and it's going to have to be spent over the next four years. Had we started two years earlier, we could have had the mapping done, uh, but we didn't. But I'm, I'm very excited, and I think so is everyone else. It's going to be really neat. And so the providers are chomping at the bits to get going, and uh, even the uh, rural electric co-ops are chomping at the bits to get going to find a provider or provide it themselves. Uh, there were 300,000 miles of distribution and transmission lines uh, co-ops have. Uh, about a third of it already had fiber optic on it. Uh, that's how they read the meters and stuff. And uh, until uh, the legislature passed the bill two sessions ago, 2019, to allow access use of that uh, uh, right-of-way easements, uh, we couldn't have done it. So we're off to a good start. We could talk all day about these subjects, but thank you all four of you gentlemen for your service to Texas and for being here today and sharing uh, your wisdom and your foresights with us. Let's give them all a great hand here. <laughs>